So uh, the assassin survey was set up in 2011. Initially, it was a survey of a single mount with two cameras uh, built off of Nikon lens, 14 centimeter aperture, wide field of view. And the idea was to do a tessellated deep survey of the sky to detect transients. So after the first two years of operations, we made our first major transient detection, which was a flare in NGC 2617. Uh, as you can see in the upper right hand corner is we have the assassin image correlated with the SDSS and MDM. This helped characterize the NGC uh, 2617 uh, helped characterize the galaxy. After that is we started adding more cameras and with more cameras, we got a higher cadence. And of course we got more coverage. Since then we've become one of the leading the discovery tools for supernovae and ca uh, cataclysmic variables. Um, however, the survey has also been used as a follow-on tool for other high energy events. So we've done follow-ups, published follow-ups on ice cube neutrino detections, as well as LIGO detections. Um, in the bottom left corner, as you can see, uh, this was a TDE discovered by my colleague, Tom Holland at the Carnegie Observatory in Pasadena. That's Assassin 19BT. And then in the bottom right is a visualization of a meta study done by one of my colleagues here in France, Thomas de Jaeger, who correlated assassin light curves with uh, Fermi objects, uh, specifically looking for flaring in um, a couple thousand blazars. So is we we're able to make an optical characterization of these Fermi data sets. So briefly about our telescope network is, um, as you can see, this is the four camera mount that we're currently using. These are Nikon lenses. And so four camera mount uh, can, um, counts as one unit. So by 2013, we added our second two cameras to the Haleakala Observatory. In 2014, we installed a full unit at CTIO. And then in 2017, we installed three more units, one in South Africa, one in Texas, and a second one in CTIO. And with these five units, this gave us, uh, this increased our observational cadence rate such that we are observing the entire visible sky on a nightly basis. Uh, furthermore, is we have a unit in the Tian Shan Mountains of China in a collaboration with the University of Beijing. Uh, this is it's been constructed and it's gathering data. However, due to the complexities of porting a Chinese state university data source into a American university data source, is we're still TBD is when we're going to start putting um, their data into our network. However, we're expecting it should be worked out within the next year or two. So more specifics about the survey is we're using 2K CCDs that are backlit and cooled. We have a nightly cadence with a wide field of view. I've noticed through the presentations here, there is a quite a wide definition of what consists of a wide field of view, but I think um, beyond Atlas and human eye, that we have one of the highest field of views that there is, widest. Uh, we have a 7.5 arc second pixel size, uh, which will matter a little bit later when I start talking about our cross correlations and cross matches with other surveys. And then so on this graphic here, as you can see, is the number of times that we've managed to observe all of the fields across the sky. The variance is due to one weather events, but two is the amount of time that our various units have been stood up. Uh, as you can see, these counts are in the several thousands. However, is once we start serving, once we serve our data out, is actually for each image that we take, it's not just a single one. What we do is we take three dithered coads of a single uh, viewing field in this great tessellation. We run the reductions and subtractions off of the reference field images. And then, so any data points that we're serving 
within our photometry is done off of these co added images. However, because of weather events is, um, I, we cannot guarantee that every single data point will be an amalgamation of three, um, uh, of three co-ads or three subtractions that make up one co-ad is it might actually just be uh, two or 2.7 due to uh, weather events. Uh, finally is, not finally, is you can see that we have two filters in use is we have a SDSS G-band filter as well as uh, Sloan V. The Sloan V is that filter was used in our first two stations. So that was the initial Haleakala station and the second CTIO station. Those remained in operation for, I believe, about three years. And then by the time uh, just after we stood up our latter three stations in 2017, those initial first two stations were converted over to G-band as well. So we're not, uh, we're not delivering multi-filter uh, data on our uh, photometry. Uh, currently, everything's coming in in G. However, is when you do query uh, light curves, et cetera, from our portals, is you will get both the legacy as well as the current G-band um, data. Uh, you can see that we have a 18.5 magnitude limit in G-band. And you might ask, how do you do that with those tiny little cameras? Well, the answer is we do very, very, very deep stacking. So for each one of those tessellated fields, we create a reference image. This is one of the reference images right here. When it says there's 22,779 sources in it, that's not 20, that's not 22,000 images that have made this up. It's we have uh, that many sources that we're serving out data on from it. However, each one of these reference images is on average, they're about 300, they're made up of about 300 to 400 individual images. And then it is we're constantly improving these reference images. And likewise, is we're so is if we get additional information that improves the mean quality of these reference images, then we add them to the stack and then we'll update all of the uh, corresponding photometry. So um, that brings me on to Sky Patrol version one. So having started out as a transient detection network, Assassin, after a couple of years, I believe in 2015, we decided to start serving out photometry from our image stacks. So doing this is we, we allowed users to run ad hoc forced photometry meaning that is if you give us a coordinate set, then we will put together a stack of images, run an IRAF uh, aperture photometry with a two pixel radius and a annulus background subtraction and give you a light curve off this. As you can imagine, this isn't the fastest tool. However, it's incredibly useful for those of you that are looking at sources that might not have a counterpart in other, other catalogs. Uh, and because of the compute resources involved with this force photometry operation is it's actually only currently available on a web portal run out th run through the Ohio State University. Uh, so that's our, I guess they're the mother of assassin and then uh, the University of Hawaii were building some other tools for them. So um, with this photometry that we deliver, uh, there's a couple uh, points is one is so for every single image that we take is we do automatic checking for bad columns and throw out any photometry data points that uh, come in with those. And then we also have some what I assume are very unfortunate grad students running manual checks on every single image that we get. So that's about 4000 a night. So they're running checks for weather interference as well as corruption. So uh, basically is if you get an image, we still will provide you the data, say if there's some high serious clouds in the field of view. However, we will put a flag on it that marks it as the quality of it is either good, bad, or unknown. Those checks are done within a day. So is when we serve you, so when we serve out a uh, live photometry, the most recent data point or two will probably have an unknown image quality. But as if you go look again, the second day is it should be updated. Oh, and then um, through this uh, Sky Patrol version one is we have two we have two options actually is we have an option um, 
I still don't fully understand why somebody would not want to have the reference uh, flux subtraction from their photometry. Um, I believe that's more the case when you're looking at solar system objects, but is we, we, we give you the option of not running the differential magnitudes from our reference images. So um, it's a great system. It's great for individual targets, uh, especially if there's no ca um, uh, catalog matching sources. However, it did motivate the development of Sky Patrol version two. So Sky Patrol version two, uh, I started developing it about three years ago, is the goal of it was to provide bulk light curves for catalog match sources across the sky. And we wanted to basically find every source that's visible um, as dictated by our magnitude um, as well as our pixel size. Uh, so we throw out everything with crowding as well. And then we wanted to make um, these sources available through um, in bulk. And we wanted to make them available via a Python client. And like I said, is we wanted to make sure that these sources that were, we don't just create an arbitrary like assassin catalog with a bunch of R and Dex, is we wanted to make sure that we have these cross matched to a number of other catalogs, such as Gaia, Tumas, et cetera, et cetera, which I'll get into. So, uh, first thing we did is we built up our input catalogs. So we use the Atlas reference catalog version two, which was built off of Gaia DR2. So that's, um, it's been described to me as a exhaustive catalog of every point source in the sky brighter than the 22nd magnitude. So that's a billion sources. Uh, I did a cut, everything in our magnitude, and then we threw out everything with a certain amount of crowding. Uh, for some reason, my footnote's not showing, but this R figure is what it means is any, uh, any source whose background magnitudes exceeds it within 20 arc seconds will throw out because that's too much crowding and uh, our pixel size is limited, right? So this left us with about 100 million uh, stellar sources to build up our initial base stellar catalog. And then because uh, the test input catalog was built off of Gaia DR2 and the test input catalog is already cross-matched to two mass, Hippocaris, all wise, is we have corresponding identifiers for a number of these. Uh, next, what I did is I basically dug through NASA HESARC and took a bunch of high energy catalogs and then cross match these uh, catalogs on a two arc second cone search to our 100 million sources and then generated independent assassin IDs for these as well. So um, as you can see up in the top left, we have the Fermi, uh, Fermi Lat 10 year source catalog, Chandra version two, Swift Mest, uh, the Swift master catalog. And then we have a number of catalogs that aren't necessarily instrument based, but they're uh, object type based. So one of the most interesting ones we're working with is the all wise AGN catalog. So the idea is basically is anybody who's working with objects from a certain type of catalog, you give us an ID, we could give you a light curve. Oh, and yes, we have solar system sources as well, but judging by this crowd, I'm not sure there's too many people that are using them. So question. Oh, you're using it. Okay. Then I'll talk about it. Okay, so is um, we basically take orbitals uh, from the, so for every image, uh, we take the most recent orbitals from the Minor Planet Center and decide is see is, is there any uh, transiting object within the field of view? And then we will, so this is for both comets and asteroids. And then we also run the aperture photometry in that as well. However, is because these objects cannot be, because they're moving, they can't be cross-matched to our general source catalog is they're independently searchable via the name designations given to them by the Minor Planet Center. And um, they're currently not available through our web interface. However, they are available with uh, our Python interface. So as you can, like we do have a couple people already mining our comet sources um, and uh, just as well uh, with our asteroids. So if you want to talk to me on that and have questions later, I'd be happy to address them. All this is publicly available, yes. 
Oh, and then that question, dot, 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 and more is so uh, I'm actually able to add new input catalogs with considerable effort if there's a science case to justify it. So most recently, it's not up in this table, is uh, one of my colleagues, Dan Hay at the University of Hawaii, is he did a mass categorization of about 5 million M giants. So we added an M giant catalog for him. And then finally, is for all of these catalogs that we include, is we're not just including the identifiers, is for every single one of these HESAR catalogs, as well as the Atlas reference catalog, is we make them searchable on all the associated columns within that catalog. So as if you want to run restrictions on, all, I know all the HESAR catalogs, um, they have parameters for galactic coordinates, as well as you could uh, search by uh, redshift, et cetera, et cetera. So is once you search through our input catalogs, then, oh no, no, this is how you search through our input catalogs. So we have four tools to search through the input catalogs. Um, we have the cone search, uh, which basically because we have all of our, uh, it's 100 million sources, so you'd assume cone search is really slow. Well, we actually keep them in a distributed in-memory lookup table, uh, thanks to Apache Spark. So as you could basically run a cone search of an arbitrary size, if you want to run like a 15 degree cone search for whatever reason, is we should be able to return results back to you within one second of how many targets are with, uh, in there. Uh, the random selection, not particularly useful for astronomers. However, I do know a number of data scientists that are basically just building models off of our light curves. So they like taking um, random unbiased samples of certain catalogs to do so. Uh, next is I wrote a dialect of the astronomical data query language uh, as specified by the IVOA and currently is in use within the Gaia archive as well as an advise our interface. So it's roughly the same. It, the grammar is well described in my documentation. However, is I did make a few things simpler, such as the cone search as well as um, cross match joins. So this uh, data query, it's really the powerhouse of the searches because it'll allow you to uh, do cross match joins so say it's like you're interested in a source that maybe has uh, a corresponding hit from like Swift as well as Fermi or, or whatever combination thereof, any of NASA, Hisar, you can say, hey, give me the catalog information on all of these catalogs for this particular set of coordinates or a cone of coordinates. Uh, you could do a lot of really interesting stuff that I'll get into. Uh, and then finally is the direct catalog lookup. As I've said, is if you have just a number of identifiers, you can kind of throw them in. So uh, here are a couple of search examples. Uh, in the Indico, the yeah, the Indico is I've included a, a Jupyter notebook. Here are a few snippets from there, but just an illustration of what the lookup is capable of doing. So as I've said, with the Hussar catalogs, every single one of them that we include, we include all the associated columns, uh, ADQL. Not sure if this has a laser pointer. Top one uh, is it shows how to run a cone search in ADQL. Um, however, you do not have to write cone searches in ADQL. There's a simple utility for doing that within the Python and web interfaces. You're able to run your joins. And then is if you want to run an arbitrarily complex search within ADQL, that is available as well. So this is searching for white dwarves, I believe, based on luminosity and restricting by magnitude. Okay, cool. So once you've downloaded the light curves is there's a number of tools that we've incorporated. Uh, this is mainly within our Python utility. Um, you can read them all up there. However, is we are, um, because this is all open source is if you are using our code um, you, and you happen to write a tool, an analysis tool for light curves, you can put up a pull request or a merge request, pull request, whatever, into GitHub, and I'm happy to incorporate and include you on the citations. The last thing is the patrols. Um, so basically what we're looking into is doing is curated specialized object sets, say such as AGNs, where it is we take uh, for every new image for all of the, say, tagged catalog images, Tag, tagged catalog targets within that image is if they meet a specific trigger function, 
then we are looking at um, distributing alerts through a variety of channels, whether that's say email, GCN, et cetera, et cetera. And then because we've also partnered with TESS and Atlas, we could, um, they're in our same data streams and servers, we could uh, distribute associated light curves, uh, force photometry as well. Uh, the user patrols is a little farther into the future is, and that's basically is where you give us a limited set of targets and you say, hey, I have this set of targets and a trigger function that I'm looking for on these targets, alert me, the, alert me as such. So that's um, the object patrols we're looking to releasing next year and the user patrols, depending on the compute and funding, maybe the year after that. So anyway, that is Assassin and Sky Patrol. Does anybody have any questions? I think I have a couple minutes.